Well, thank you very much, Henry. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, um, mo uh, to moderate this uh, last panel of the day. Of course, uh, having a late panel always has, we have the benefit of having listened to everyone else and benefited from everything we learned. The challenge, of course, is to bring something new uh, to the table. And uh, given the panelists we have, I think we will be able to do that. The topic of our panel is uh, challenges and opportunities. So we heard a lot about uh, money today. We had different perspectives on how one could uh, look at money. I will try to give again a little bit a different uh, um, perspective, which is not, not very controversial. It's just an economist's perspective. But one who could, who could say the monetary system that we have is really built of these two layers. We have a base money, also called outside money. And then there is a, a derivative money that is, that is based on that base money, or sometimes also called inside money. And when we were under the gold standard, of course, the outside money was the gold or a commodity, specifically the gold. And we had some type of bank money that was the derivative money. And what is uh, typical for these two layers is that the, the derivative money is redeemable in base money. And the trick of the base money or the, the important function is to keep this base money uh, scarce. And with gold, of course, scarcity was done by nature itself. We moved, as we all know, to a fiat uh, system where central banks provide the base money, central bank money, and they keep it scarce by their monetary policy, by managing it. And now in the world we are now, we have the new kids on the block. We have cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, where scarcity is guaranteed by the code. And then we have stable coins, which I call derivative money, because they are based again uh, on the base money. Interestingly, we do not see stable coins being based on, on Bitcoin or on cryptocurrencies uh, because of that, uh, the problem that we have, that we have a, a very large price volatility. But uh, stable coins are based again, as we heard in several panels today, on uh, fiat money and even non-custodial uh, stable coins. They at least pack their value to the US dollar in general, to the fiat. So you could say if they do not need CBDC, apparently they still need the Fed to provide that, uh, that anchor. So that's one, one way to look at it. And of course, the question for us then in terms of CBDC is really the question of who gets access to the base money, who gets access to the central bank money that we are providing and we heard before in the panel circle, for instance, they would like to get direct access to central bank money by having an account with the Fed, just like commercial banks do nowadays. Another way to provide, um, provide access to central bank money would, of course, be a CBDC, a wholesale CBDC, or at the retail level, a retail CBDC. So these are a bit the questions that we, that we are discussing uh, when we talk about CBDC and DeFi. Now, central banks, and I would like to take a step back here, they are not only uh, in charge or mandated to, to keep money stable, but they have a mandate actually for financial stability. They are the lender of last resort. I don't know whether you already had a chance to look at the Wall Street Journal today, but today you have this article uh, in the business and finance section that says short sellers bet Tether uh, is vulnerable to runs. Also something we talked about today. So the question would be that I would like to discuss is not only do we need a CBDC in DeFi, but do we need other central bank functions in, C in DeFi? Do we need a lender of last resort, for instance, uh, in DeFi? And if we want to take that a step further, and I probably don't make uh, a lot of friends uh, in all corners with that. We remember the, the DAO attack in 2016. And one could say that was a bailout of the first DAO ever. It was too big to fail. That's the words that actually were used in the Coindesk article. Uh, at the time, at least, uh, the 60 million hack of the DAO was considered too big to fail, and there was a bailout. Uh, action. So do we need, so apparently 
Uh, there are also uh, things that happen, uh, can happen in a DeFi world, and the question is, do we need someone in charge to, to do these bailouts? Uh, at the time, uh, the community came together, uh, and it was solved uh, by, by basically rolling back the history on the Ethereum blockchain, and you had a fork as a result. You can say, okay, that's, that's okay. Those who didn't want to participate have now their own blockchain. Those who participated, uh, so, so that's a possible solution that we, that we have for these kinds of accidents. Now, the question then is central bank functions, and I would say most basically controlling money, preserving financial stability, and safeguarding the payment system in the current world, uh, that is done uh, by central banks, and the easy access points for central bank are the financial intermediaries. And also for regulation, financial intermediaries are the access point. And the question, of course, that also came up already several times today is, if we take the intermediaries away, uh, how do we deal with this? How do we do the central bank uh, functions? How do we do regulation? And it's also not the case that we have nothing in between, but we have smart contracts there. Mainly the interaction now is not with intermediaries, but it's with smart contracts. And the question is, for central banks, is there a role here to provide these functions that the central bank provides also in DeFi world that acts with a smart contracts? Of course, we could even be more radical and say, why not also have the functions done by a central bank by smart contracts and get rid of the central bank? And we could have a DAO as a central bank, which I herewith officially christened uh, the DANB, the Decentralized Autonomous National Bank, uh, which could fulfill the functions of a central bank nowadays, and maybe regulation the same. Maybe we can also have a smart contract, or at least embed regulation in the smart contracts that are used in DeFi. Now, we heard uh, several times also the question, how decentralized is DeFi? And what I take from the discussion really is that, uh, that there are different shades of DeFi. So we do not only have the corner solution of totally CeFi and totally DeFi, but we have uh, different, um, different grades or shades in between. And I took this from a paper that uh, addressed this question. Uh, Fabian gave his definition. Uh, there, are, as he said, there are other definitions, and one uh, that I found uh, interesting here in this paper was uh, really a decision tree that looked at who can do what. So the first question was, uh, does do the, the, the users have uh, custody of the assets? Uh, if you say no, then you're in, in, in centralized finance. Then you go further and, uh, and ask, can anyone single-handedly censor uh, a transaction execution? Uh, then you would go into something that has a DeFi settlement but a, a CeFi intermediary. Or next, uh, can someone uh, single-handedly uh, censor a protocol execution? Then you would have something like uh, um, centrally governed DeFi, or if you answer all these questions with no, you would be in DeFi. So, so we have different forms, different degrees, different shades of, uh, of DeFi that we deal with. And then the final question before I open up uh, to the panel, something that I would also like to ask the panelists is, does DeFi scale? I think this is also a question we have already uh, touched upon. Uh, but for me, uh, I'm, I don't know whether it's fortunately or unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember uh, the emergence of Web1. And what we were promised was this, a peer-to-peer -peer network. And what we got is this. A uh, pretty centralized uh, network. Now, the question, of course, uh, is how will Web3 look like? Uh, does DeFi scale? Do we get, again, something centralized? Uh, and if not, why not? And if centralized, why? We heard several reasons. There are technical reasons. Uh, Roche, Watten Roche Wattenhofer, for instance, uh, reminded us that the central solution is always the most efficient. Could that be something that drives centralization? We heard economic reasons, uh, economies of scale, um, network effects. Could that drive centralization? Uh, and then we also have the users themselves. Not everyone wants to be her own bank. 
Alice sometimes is very happy if somebody else does all the services uh, for her. And Web2, we have to say, most people loved it. Most people love a centralized uh, network. So the question is, do we go there again or not? What does regula uh, regulation have to do with it? We also touched upon this. It's much easier for regulation to have intermediaries. Does regulation force intermediaries up on DeFi? So that's really the question we want to go into. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities uh, going ahead? And for that, we have, a, a, again, a fantastic panel. And let me start by asking the panelists to introduce themselves. And Andreas, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, my name is Andreas Klarner. I'm heading the FinTech DLT team at MME. We are a law firm here in Switzerland. We've been active in the space for almost soon 10 years now, so a very long time. And my role is originally a tech lawyer, but now discovering this interface between technology and regulations, between CFI and DeFi, supporting our clients to navigate through the regulatory fields. And maybe I, I add here, what, what did get you into the DeFi space? Why are you working in this space? Oh, on, uh, well, again, coming from a, from a tech side and interest, having had interest in technology, uh, I think it's probably the best place to be in if you're a lawyer now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nothing it's more fine. exciting, <laughs> nothing more that uh, you mm -hmm. can help shaping a new world. Thank you. I mean, yeah. Hey, so my name is Amit. I lead the DeFi research at a Polygon a technology. So let me give a brief background about Polygon. Polygon is an Ethereum scaling solution, and we will talk about it. Like, uh, that has been a word in the town. And it, like, I don't want to get into too much technical. I know it's a trail end. So think of it like a perfect example would be a Swiss knife. Like, we have all the set of tools to scale it from POS chain, side chain, sovereign chains, and ZK rollup. I mention ZK rollup because we as a company has allocated $1 billion from our tre treasury to ramp up the scalability problem. And that's a, and the scale of uh, the Polygon users, around half a million people use it. And our core thing is like a highly secure and least transaction cost. 0.014 is the transaction cost. Personally, my role is to help people build the DeFi protocols and the range of people who I deal with, with like a bunch of uh, college dropouts to billion dollar financial institutions. <laughs> so a big range, <laughs> um, yeah. And what got you into DeFi? Oh, <laughs> uh, so my, my journey is, has been a bit of a, you know, diversified, like I'm an engineer, uh, engineer by background, worked for traditional big banks, um, had done my PhD, uh, some of the projects on DeFi, but the main thing which draws me is like background. So my, so my grandfather was a, a farmer. Every year he used to buy a futures contract, but uh, that, that was never obligated, right? Uh, so that, dri that drives me, the, the financial inclusion part, the decentralization part. So I think that's what would drive me to the DeFi. Thank you. Lex. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lex, and uh, <laughs> I had two brownies and a coffee to, to have some pizzazz for, uh, <laughs> for this panel, because it's, it's tough. Uh, it, it, but I'll, I'm going to try to disagree with everybody, uh, just so you know ahead of time. OK, so we're on track. I'm not switching topics. <laughs> Everything's fine. So I work for Consensus. Uh, I lead the crypto economics team at Consensus. Consensus is at the heart of Web3, which is Ethereum plus Polygon plus a number of other um, underlying uh, computational blockchains that run all the software, that run all these smart contracts. And so um, Consensus is best known for uh, MetaMask, the crypto wallet. So if you are using DeFi, very likely you have a Fox installed in your browser, and hopefully you, um, you don't give anybody your seed phrase. And then uh, the second thing that we do is we help developers build stuff. So um, we have a pretty deep developer tech stack from Infura to Quorum, institutional, uh, independent, and just getting as much of the ecosystem up off the ground. And then my role is, um, 
is cryptoeconomics. And that's a combination of token engineering, a combination of treasury and balance sheet management, because we take revenue in hundreds of currencies. Some of them are the long tail of Binance Smart Chain trading, so you can imagine the quality of that revenue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, whoever is laughing. It's really important to me that you do. Um, and then finally, DAOs and Web3 participation. So those, I think, are, are kind of the key tools of a crypto economic team. And what got you into DeFi? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. So I'm, if you're, you ever watch YouTube and you start out like watching something normal and it's just, you know, you look something up and then you just click next and it kind of gets weirder, and then you click next, and then two hours later, the, the earth is flat and everybody's a lizard person. Um, so, so that's kind of what happened to me. Um, I started out uh, on Wall Street in uh, uh, strategy and for an investment, $300 billion investment management business within Lehman Brothers. And so that gave me uh, a fantastic experience very early on in my career, and I've kind of self-radicalized. Like I started with Wall Street, then I went into fintech entrepreneurship and built out a digital investing business, um, and then from there felt like fintech just wasn't doing enough. Um, and seeing what Ethereum and Web3 is able to do um, has just been a really profound, um, profound and inspirational change for me to, to dedicate my career. Thank you, Morton. Uh, Morten Beck, I head up the Swiss Center of the BIS uh, Innovation Hub. Um, I'm an economist by training. Uh, I worked at the Danish Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, and now I work for the Bank of Central Banks. Uh, my mom always reminds me that I never had a real job in my life, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's my background. <laughs> Thank and, you. And, and I'm not in DeFi. <laughs> okay, not yet. Um, so I think a fair summary of today's discussion would be, uh, in terms of the question that has been asked by the conference, would be, um, does uh, DeFi need a safe DeFi need a CBDC? I think the answer would be not necessarily, but it could be helpful. If we now, I think everyone would agree, maybe with the exception of Lex. Uh, I disagree already. <laughs> But if we take one step back, Morten, uh, I talked about central banks more, more generally. Do you see a role for central banks at all in DeFi? Um, should be no surprise. I, I do. Um, I like to paraphrase a quote by Bill Gates, which is that uh, banking is essential, uh, banks are not. And I actually think it also applies to central banks. Uh, so central banking is essential, uh, central banks are not. So what do I mean? I think central banking, what is central banking about? Is as you mentioned, it's about providing um, monetary and financial stability. Uh, both of those are public goods, so what we economists will call non-rival and non-excludable. And if it's left to the private sector, it's under provision from a welfare perspective. So I think that that, um, that is what we, we still need. I haven't heard anything today that suggests that that in, in this new world of, of DeFi, that that would not be the case. Sometimes technology actually changes what is a public good. Those of you that can remember broadcast TV that was transmitted over the air, that was a classic example of, of a public good, but then along came cable, satellite, and scrambling, and it's no longer a public good. It's a, I think it's what we call a club good. So sometimes technology changes that. But I haven't heard anything today that leads me to believe that monetary and financial stability, even in a world where we, we only have uh, DeFi, that that still would not be a public good. So you would need somebody to implement that. Um, does that have to be a central bank? No, not necessarily. There's a train of economics that really thinks that institution matters. I think Evan highlighted where good, bad institutions do bad things, but good institutions can do uh, good things. Um, but I think it's important that institutions uh, keep up to speed, and especially for central banks or other public institutions, what goes on in technology. Um, and I actually think, if I just want to side, I think that's exactly what the BIS Innovation Hub is about, is to make sure that, that, that central banks keep up uh, with technology, that we help them kind of like push out the production possibility frontier in both terms of financial stability, but also monetary stability. So, so I think, yes, central banking, no matter like the functions, as you mentioned, of, of a central bank, I think they will be needed also in a future financial system where, where we have DeFi. 
How are we actually going to go about doing that? It might look, look maybe different. There might be different uh, functions or a way or instruments uh, in the way that we do that. Thank you. Lex, you said before you don't necessarily agree. Would you see a CBDC helpful to the DeFi um, ecosystem? Yeah, so I, I do think it would be helpful, um, but I think we're talking a bit at a level of abstraction that, at least for me, feels um, disconnected from some of the like underlying economy stuff that's going on, right? And um, often for me, it's helpful to, to turn it back to the consumer, the user perspective. So like from a tech company perspective, right? Like what's the product and what's the value proposition? What is the user, what is the person doing? Um, and people aren't doing anything new. They are paying, they have money in motion, and then they are saving, and then that money comes to rest. It needs some sort of interest, and they have enough of it, they invest it, or they trade it. And then you have asset management product grow up, and then you have insurance product grow up, and so on, right? So these financial functions are, a thousand years ago, be these same financial functions. So are today's institutions necessary for people to do those financial functions a thousand years ago? Absolutely not, right? They were, they were able to transact and go to a market and buy stuff and save um, with a pretty different set of tools. And in a thousand years from now, will the things that we have be relevant? Absolutely not. They will be better. You know, they will be uh, on a different architecture. And so the, the tricky thing is that um, I think in our current economy, the, or in our, in our current like, capital markets architecture and payment architecture, we have very different rails and very different regulations, right? So like a portfolio management system is different from a card network, is different from a bank core processing system, and so we kind of think of it differently, and we think of money market funds pretty differently from how we think about um, what happens when you swipe a Visa card even though for a regular person it's just money, right? And we kind of talk, we're talking about money um, in this conversation, but for a user it's very different and different architectures. But in, in Web3, it's all the same Borg soup, right? It's, it's basically, everything's been melted down into a general um, computational platform, and so we have this confusion of a cash sweep, a stable coin essentially being a the cash part of an asset allocation, which was a, a point made earlier, which totally makes sense. People want to settle into cash for their exposure. And that's quite different from you paying for a sandwich with your phone or a card tap. And I feel like a lot of the conversation about CBDC is paying for a sandwich. You know, but you wouldn't pay for a sandwich with Apple stock. You wouldn't pay for a sandwich with money market funds. And so I think there's, there's a lot of still kind of pulling apart that we have to do before you can say, this is what a CBDC will be used for by the people who will end up uh, using it within a DeFi context. How, I mean, consensus works a lot also with central banks, I understand. You do a lot of education, you do workshops and so on. How would a, how would a CBDC have to be designed to be useful? Maybe we can then look at the question yeah. that way. How would it have to be designed to be useful for DeFi? Or what functionality would it need to have? I think you, you um, this is just the, the framework I have, so I'm biased and kind of pushing it forward. But I do think that you have to start with, you know, what is it for? So like the discussion about DVP and settlement within a context of wholesale capital markets or something like that, that's a useful, um, both technologic and, uh, technological and financial outcome, right? So designing for that is gonna be great. No one's gonna be buying sandwiches with that particular version of it. And then alternately, if you want to solve for retail CBDC that is really good for tax collection or for um, distributing universal basic income or something like that, that's, that's a, just a different um, use case problem. And you're probably going to end up using different scalability solutions, right? So um, something like Polygon uh, or uh, the ZK technologies or things of that nature, you'll probably think about lots of throughput. You'll think about um, anonymity and privacy for like people expressing commerce and consumption preferences. But when it comes to 
I'm an endowment and I have lots of crypto assets and I want to rebalance into cash because there's a war, you know, you are going to have kind of a different architecture, I believe. And so it, it starts from, it, this sort of naive of me to say, but it starts from the problem and it, it lands with the answer only after you get the problem right. Okay, so that would be a little bit like we provide uh, central bank money now in in an account form, but also in paper form. So depending on the use case, you would have a different different type of uh, CBDC. Maybe Amit, can you add to that and maybe also say something about scalability? So Polygon is uh, really working on uh, on the scalability of uh, DeFi. Yeah. Uh, before the scalability, I think one quote which I really want to have is like about George Orwell. Like he said, like all animals are equals, but some animals are more equal than others. Just to rephrase, all money is equal, but some money <laughs> is more equal than others. <laughs> I, so this is what like you know a perspective from a DeFi world. Like that's what uh, that's the perspective which people are now growing in. Uh, that's a narrative, like a, something like a CBDC versus a DeFi or central bankers regulation versus the decentralized world. But I don't believe this narrative. It's not like uh, they're going to be a war or something like that. We can work in a collaborative way. The reason why I feel the collaboration and what we can learn from each other, it's an objective because all the regulation, all the mechanics has to be there, has to be an objective. And we have a central bank, a, a great institution, and we have a DeFi. Our objectives are same. Like, what are our objectives? Financial inclusion, we have already chatted about it. Reducing transaction costs, yes. Uh, privacy, there has been a, we should acknowledge, there has been a change in culture. Privacy is very, very, very important to users. They are willing to sacrifice a lot of efficiency gain for privacy, and we have seen that. Uh, <clears throat> so, if the object and the last objective, I think uh, you would be surprised to hear that financial stability. <laughs> uh, why? And I, everybody knows it's something important. It's, it's the important stuff for uh, central banks, but it is growing to be important for DeFi world as well. Uh, I am running uh, agent level financial stability sim uh, simulations on like large clusters. And I am uh, seeing that uh, the, own the owners of the protocol are doing so. And we have real life examples. People do stress test now. And uh, I was talking to one of the colleague in a um, uh, uh, national bank. And I want to connect to such team and we align our processes of uh, stress testing with what the real economy does. So that's what, like, what we are doing in terms of objective. Uh, the final question, like just connecting the dot with Lex, uh, like how I feel the CBDC would be helpful. Um, it's a retail CBDC which I'm like literally after. Like uh, uh, the wholesale CBDC, like uh, it would be not fair to have a discussion in a country like Switzerland. Already the things are pretty stable. Not more efficiency gain to be um, coming from them, unless unless you have a black swan event like in a, in a dream or something like that. <laughs> but. Uh, what I mean by retail CBDC, you look at the DeFi, one of the cool innovations of a DeFi, lending protocols. Uh, I, I imagine that CBDC uh, can come to the lend, those lending protocols, right? Uh, why it's important? It's important because now it's a great, that lending platform is a great equalization platform. Uh, with a minimal transaction cost, with secure private net uh, privacy, uh, a farmer in suppose let's say rural part of Europe can have a same cost of borrowing as a multi-billion company like building a factory. So that's what like if, if CBD can come in like that way that like would be more than acknowledged. Second thing which I think which would be very important like gone are the days we have like a um, awesome person from Curve sitting down here like oh so uh, w when I was working in uh, one of the traditional finance firm like uh, one of the largest, actually. <laughs> uh, everybody was worried about settlement, T0, T1, T2. Like, I used to worry about that. With the technology we are right now, like, it's like literally T, no zero, like instantaneous. Like, uh, so what I want, what I think uh, that CBDC can really put in uh, effort, like, uh, is that coming to those kind of efficient financial market, low, uh, increasing the efficiency and 
in fact, not one CBDC, all the CBDC coming together in a platform and have it cohesive environment with a stable coin. Like you can swap the CBDC with the, the other part, uh, the other stable coins. Mm. So that's what like, I think would be the great uh, innovation in the CBDC world, because that will serve the objective because that again reconnects to my thought about there has, the regulation has to be an objective. It's a public good we are talking about. Uh, <laughs> but the, the scaling part, uh, the scaling part is actually pretty interesting. Uh, the blockchain world is moving really, really fast. We know that, like, and the amount of money which we are just seeing is enormous. Like, we as a company just raised around, uh, let me, figure of uh, around $450 million uh, just for, and we are investing it in the technology. And I just told, like, we commit, we, we have a token and uh, uh, we do have a treasury. So we committed $1 billion to have this ZK roll-up uh, uh, fully scalable solution. And now I think I should connect to the one of the presentation, a great presentation on the scalability issue, what we have. So I am an ETH guy. I got onboarded myself on the ETH first, then the Bitcoin paper happened, I think, in one of the train journey. <laughs> uh, so the ETH now, so we want to kind of be connected with a large uh, connected network, which has a scalability potential, uh, which is fully decentralized, completely secure. We want to scale it up. So, so what we are exactly in line with what how the scaling and network uh, uh, solution looks in the real world a same network ethereum but we're going to scale it in a better technology zk and improving pos <coughs> and everything will be built on the P, uh, evm framework so uh, the the biggest problem the applications or the DeFi application right now have is like it's very difficult to move them from one platform to other so that's what the scalability will come from, like what we'll provide, we'll build on the Ethereum system, and just with the single uh, minor changes, you will be fully scalable. That's what I think, yeah. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, scalability and uh, regulation. Is there a connection there? Do you, see, do you see obstacles from a regulatory point of view to scalability? And... Um, how would, how, how would CBDC fit in there? Would, would CBDC be helpful in regulatory terms? Yeah, well, I think at the end of the day, question kind of focuses or the boils down to the question, well, what are the current regulatory or other challenges in DeFi and how could CBDC solve those issues? So we first need to look at those challenges. And now, for, from my perspective, not being, uh, you know, involved in any monetary policies, but more from a legal and regulatory side. Of course, I mean, we have a lot of regulatory questions around DeFi, depending on how you define DeFi. I think there was an exercise done in the morning. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, they, they're all around uh, regulatory liability of the developer DeFi, deployer of technology, liquidity providers, the users. The question is, are there any central players or central activities which trigger a regulatory liability. And then, of course, it depends on the type of digital assets involved, what type of regulatory liability there could be. Uh, I think that's one side. And here, uh, from, from, I don't really see CBDC to solving those regulatory problems. They, you know, if it's DeFi, it's DeFi. We need to look at that anyway, independent of the underlying assets of, of the stable coins versus CBDC. I think more on a on a practical level, uh, when I look at the DeFi landscape, I see it to be very fragmented. You have you know, thousands of different assets split around uh, different chains and protocols. Uh, you have a, a rather complicated user interfaces, which um, I think most people in this room don't use on a daily basis. And, and there are reasons for that, because it's just simply a bit too complicated. And um, I, I think there, the question of scalability comes into play. It's, it's, my, it's about making things less complex also, Ma making access convenient for the user to get to a, more of a wider adoption scale. And I think if we go down that route, one thing is the technical solution for that, but the other side is the question whether or not users don't, would prefer to deal through a 
kind of some form of an intermediary and be more comfortable having an intermediary in place who helps them accessing DeFi. And at that point, we, we kind of move DeFi to CeFi. We build a bridge between CeFi and DeFi. I think there's something many players in the market, both from a DeFi side as well as from a CeFi side, are looking at to how can we build those bridges. And if you have such a bridge and you're in a much more regulated space because you're not DeFi, you're CeFi, then of course uh, the discussion on the use of CDBC makes a lot of sense because stable coins as of today, depending on what kind of stable coins, they have uh, their own inherent risks, their own uncertainty on the legal qualification. Could there be securities, depending on the setup? Certainly in one jurisdiction, we heard that in a panel earlier. And uh, if you would have a CBDC on that side, that may help, but it probably doesn't solve all the issues. Uh, I think from my side, you, you create a whole net, a new set of, of questions because CBDC is likely to be you know, in one protocol, probably most likely not a pro public chain. And if you want to use it in DeFi, in a, in a public environment, you again need to wrap those uh, CBDCs and put it on a different chain and who's going to do that and what kind of legal framework will be built around that. So many nice questions to be solved. Thank you. Morten, um, CBDC, I mean, central banks are really talking about uh, CBDC deployment on permissioned networks. Is there any thought, any, any pilot or any idea about uh, issuing CBDC on a public uh, blockchain? Um, not that I'm really aware of. I, th I think there's a lot of thinking about it, but I think, as you said, I think central banks are just inherently much more comfortable with the notion of a wholesale CBDC. I think uh, retail CBDCs tend to raise uh, a lot of other questions, um, not at least like actually having to deal with retail customers, which I think uh, would, would be a challenge for, for most central banks. So, so I think... But, in, but it would be interesting if central banks were starting to consider more uh, detail how to do uh, retail CBDCs uh, on blockchain or public blockchain. I think, think there might be some, a couple of uh, uh, experiments out there where they're looking at it, but, but some of the ones that are, are most uh, uh, furthest ahead, are they really public blockchain? What are they really doing? Uh, I, th I think it's a... I think, I think we're still a couple of years away from something like that. Well, one thing that was mentioned uh, already earlier, but also now again by Andreas, is that uh, intermediaries could be basically a gateway uh, to the DeFi space. Uh, I know um, Consensus is, is, is building applications uh, for that. So do you need intermediaries, or, or can you also uh, just build applications and uh, make it much more convenient for users? I'm going to hijack this question. <laughs> you knew it already. You, you knew it. Okay. I'm going to try to remember the question, but I do want to hijack it because there's been a couple of really interesting points to respond to. Um, I think one idea just to put in there is that stable coins are sort of, not really, but especially with Tether, are the cumulative on-ramp into crypto. Right? So you're... you're uh, putting in fiat, you're getting tokenized fiat, and essentially it's a, it's, it goes up because it's just com it's a cumulative chart of fiat flowing into crypto. And so I do think there's a, gr there's a really useful function of a CBDC to, uh, to make that, I mean, it's already kosher in the sense of um, uh, some, some of the instruments that exist, but to make it even easier and, and have better infrastructure and make it you know, part of, part of M2 or whatever it is. I, th I think that function is there. But I want to twist the, the frame again a little bit because we're talking about finance and money as, as if it's the uh, independent variable, as if it's, it's the thing, but it's not. You know, finance is a feature. Finance is the thing that grows up. You have an economy, and then you have finance attach itself like a mushroom in order to serve the things in the economy and do risk transformation, blah, blah, blah. Right? Like We're not actually in the business of organic productivity. We're, we're in the business of enabling the economy to function well in a smooth way with price stability and so on. And so some of this framing of like, how can we take this DeFi infrastructure 
which is a machine that makes financial product, which is similar to other older machines that make financial product, and how can we attach this new machine to our you know, traditional economy or somehow plug it into the asset management workflow or whatever. And it, it also is part of this thing of thinking about crypto as an asset class, right? Like crypto is just Bitcoin and it goes up like this and so I need to asset allocate to it and wouldn't it be nice if it was just in a Fidelity account? I mean, the answer is, is for me, is that that's, that's like super wrong. Like that, that's entirely not what we should be doing. Um, it's, it's not interesting. It will be done, and it has been done, to have the, the buy Bitcoin inside of an asset manager or broker, but that's really an, 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 an uninteresting outcome. So, the, so then what's, what's the actual way, I think, to think about it is, is, and this is a journey I've gone through myself, which took a while, is to think of DeFi, again, as an outcome of a Web3 economy that actually generates GDP. Now, you might have skepticism about how valuable somebody's generation of metaverse GDP is. You might not believe that punks are worth millions of dollars. You might not think that um, a DAO uh, should be able to raise um, $450 million uh, or you know, billions of dollars and have a treasury to deploy it. You might have these opinions. Uh, they're wrong, but you might, you're, you're entitled to, to have them. Uh, it's fine. Um, and so, there is underlying economic activity, and it's, just not, it's not just issuing NFTs, it's not just reputation, it's the launch of networks that, you know, it's the launch of protocols, it's the launch of companies that are being capitalized and organized in a completely different way uh, where the value accrues to the tokens, right? And so you now have literally a GDP that lives largely outside of the traditional system. That economy is massively attractive to Facebook, Square, you know, to the point where they want to change their name and pretend to be part of that cohort. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that controversial? I, is, um, okay, 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 I, I, I'm on track. So, so you have this Web3 economy that's generating actual operating activity that matters, where people are building things that are, that are organic bottoms up. And then out of that, grows out a finance system, which looks like every finance system ever in terms of pay, invest, save, trade, lend, insure. Nothing, nothing weird about it, it's just the functions that people need. And then it sits on top of that Web3 economy naturally. And that's where it should sit. That's, that's what it should empower, right? So it's not about how do we get that inside of an asset manager. That's a, that's, that's a strange question. The right question is, what's the economy that's growing up here um, how can, we, how can we bank it? How can we engage in it? How do we build the pathway of fiat money there? Because if we don't, we're you know, irrelevant. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's a lot more difficult. So it's, it's something that I wanted to frame for folks. But, but is that the only thing DeFi will be then? I can make the argument, although I think most people would disagree with me, but I can make the argument that the Web3 economy is going to be more valuable than the meat space economy. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of you don't believe it um, intuitively, but you can look at things like uh, Amazon and e-commerce as a share of all commerce. You know, at 2% of, as, as a share of all commerce is just a little startup. At 5%, it's a big tech company in every index. At 20% during the pandemic, it's calling the shots with every government in the world and getting you know, $500 million subsidies from New York so that people can go work there. Um, so I do think that there is a much broader shift about what people find uh, valuable to spend time on. You know, and I think we all have this bias of like, it's real, like this glass, you know, th this is worth more than if I rendered this glass and put it into sandbox, right? Like this, this is real, or like a piece of bread, that's valuable. And the piece of bread's gonna be uh, a pound 50, and the metaverse piece of bread is gonna be you know, one and a half million dollars, or, or however much the ETH rock yeah. is. Um, and so I think, I wouldn't presume that the other is too small. I would, I would treat it as something that is really important to build rails into. Um, and I know I'm ranting, so I'll give one last thing and then stop. Uh, when you get into an Uber, you don't think about putting cash into your phone to pay for the Uber. And, and in the same way, when you think about DeFi and Web3, 
think of it on its own terms and the, and the structures that it has. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I may add on that, I mean, I, I really like the thought and I do share the conclusions. You, you mentioned one thing at the very end of, of your statement by saying, well, we should think of you know, treating that as a separate economy, but then consider how to make it bankable. So how to build the bridge into the financial system as of today, because if it would be a separate economy by itself fully, we wouldn't need to make it bankable. So, so we're looking at bridging uh, to the banking world, and without you know, saying that's wrong or right, it's just if banks are have an interest in making DeFi bankable, they also see that as an asset management opportunity. So you automatically go into that direction, even though it's not the key question to ask, it's one which is on the table. I, I agree with you, and obviously what I'm saying is, is rhetorical to get folks to think about it from the other side, because everything you're, you're saying is true as well. Uh, I will uh, rather bring the discussion much more closer to the finance world <laughs> rather than the metaverse. <laughs> um, so b plain and simple, like uh, that's an, uh, a fact of past data. Technological progress can only bring the growth in the current state of world, unless you are nihilistic and believe the destruction and go for a war and start building things from scratch. Uh, that's, that's a reality. I think everybody agrees that. And like we at uh, uh, blockchain, crypto, DeFi, believe that technological progress is the reason. Uh, now comes uh, the fact like how we are building it in our own uh, metaverse or decentralized finance way. Uh, what we are providing are new financial products, like what we recognize that current financial products are not uh, working in the sense for a mass consumer or maybe even for the large, large institutional players as well. Like, uh, if, you, like uh, if you move towards other parts of the world, even large institutional players face this counterparty risk, uh, systematic risk from a government. Uh, we, make, uh, we are making liable a um, lot other smaller play, pl uh, players, but transparency in government expenditures. This is one of the main, uh, should be one of the, the main thing, and they should put all of their expenditures on blockchain, a public ledger. Everybody can view them. Uh, but going back, like the innovation in financial market, I think somebody mentioned uh, that um, uh, from the policy group uh, that uh, the value of uh, this asset class is reducing because neither um, the inflation, hedge against the inflation, nor it is a return value because there's a lot of drawdown, things go worse. Uh, um, but we have the same products in the traditional finance world, and they do have an interesting products called structured products, advanced financial products, the world of derivatives, the world. So, what's, so the next generation products in the DeFi are already thinking about these things. They are going, they are going to give the low wall target products, structured products, which are going to behave exactly like what is a combination of an equities and a bond market. Uh, that's what we are looking at, and that would be completely scalable. And you don't have to go, you don't have to go to a large bank and play large transaction costs. You can do it in like literally one transaction point zero one six dollars on Polygon. I asked a question before about Web One, Web Two. You know that uh, that uh, we were promised a peer-to-peer -peer world that did not materialize. What, what makes you so sure that it works this time around? I mean, of course, Web2, we had also transaction costs decreasing dramatically, but we have this, uh, this big tax. How, how, what, what do you think is the difference now with Web3? Is it that the technology is different? Is it, uh, is it that we will regulate it differently? Or how confident are you that we are staying in a decentralized world? I think the monetization part is uh, different. The one thing which is going to make a huge difference is the data monetization part in Web2. And that's what the culture is right now, the change, structural change. Nobody is willing to trade a large amount of private data, even the likes on the maybe on uh, the, one of the biggest social networking platforms with for some maybe ad generation, revenue generation, those kind of private things. So that's going to be one of the biggest difference, I think. The, the, the rule of the game is going to be changed. Maybe down the line, uh, uh, you're going you're gonna to get paid to do some likes or swaps. Ted, do you want anyone to chip in on that? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take it, but I don't want to um, abuse the privilege. So am I allowed? Yes, of okay. course. Go All ahead. Right. Um, so 
I think it's a great question because human nature is not going to change. People aren't going to stop trying to build monopolies and, and be profitable. Um, but it does come down to, uh, it all comes down to incentives and, and what the constraints are. And so I think um, there are, there, there's, a pol there's kind of a philosophical polarity now that's, that's changing. Um, I, I think it's in finance and it's in crypto and in money, but it's much broader and you see it everywhere in the world. And it's kind of this change between institutional, institutionalism and populism, right? And that's kind of the polarity. And the internet, um, which for a long time really had this one definition, is now splintering into two different philosophical camps. And they have different incentive structures and, and they have different economic function. And so um, if you'll allow me the sketch, you know, the, the first one is, is this um, sort of everything is free. And, and artists, for example, digital artists today are really, a lot of them are really struggling with NFTs because they grew up on this remix culture of the internet. Everything's Creative Commons, everything is um, you know, shared, uh, it's Napster culture, and peer-to-peer -peer means everything's free. Obviously in crypto land, peer-to-peer -peer does not mean that, it means the opposite. Crypto is the best digital rights management technology ever built. So you have this model of everything's free, and that's ingrained in the DNA, and so if everything's free, then nothing is worth anything. And so the, you know, the marginal cost to produce is nothing, and so everybody has everything, and the, the outcome to that is that you, you have to curate, and essentially you have to curate and package things for people so that they, um, it's kind of a feudal system, feudal in the sense of there's a castle. It's usually a castle built out of uh, robot artificial intelligence that picks things for you. So if you open up Instagram or Facebook or whatever, right, like your counterparty is largely a gigantic machine learning system um, trained on you. Uh, and so you're inside of this feudal system in this castle and you're grazing on the stuff it gives you and you're eating the dopamine it provides. Um, and then your consumption of that stuff is packaged into attention products and sold uh, up the stream for folks who need your attention, right, into adver the advertising model. And so that's fine. We, it, it's not clear that's where you get to from having everything be free, and, but, but it is where we ended up. Mm -hmm. And then the, the crypto world is um, so deeply different in its incentive, right? So the mom instead of monopolizing attention, what you start with is you start with this like anarchic, hyper-capitalist, Hobbesian base of um, law and economics encoded into software. And so if I steal your Bitcoin and now I have it, well, too bad for you. You should have watched your keys. You know, if you lost your laptop or you bought a pizza or if I got your NFT and you clicked on my link, too bad, it's mine. There's, there's no enforcement mechanism, right? And so that's the, um, that's the Hobbesian nightmare on which you start. Um, but then what you get on top of it is really I mean, it's almost unbelievable. It's magical, this moment. Um, what you have now are these collections of decentralized autonomous organizations, which to me look like labor collectives. They are like communistic or collect they're collectivist architecture. People come together and they say, we are going to build something. We're going to launch a token. And because we're owners of it, we're going to benefit from the fruits of our labor. So it's, it's just, it's unbelievable, the language, because it is the language of the, you know, uh, seizing the means of production so that we, we don't have to perform for the capitalist. But it works because you have, this type, you have this software which intermediates all the commerce. And then on top of it, you have the human organizations that soften all of that and create social constructs and are starting to humanize the ability to be in that environment. And so compared to the, the feudal environment that requires a monopoly for attention selling, the outcomes here are gonna be very different just based on the incentives. They will still be unequal, they will still have a bad Gini coefficient, but they will be different distributions of people who receive the outcomes on one side and the other. And so I think just by the nature of it being kind of like a dialectic, it's very productive. So different incentives, different business model, uh, basically, so if I want to simplify it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, one thing that came up uh, already twice today in the panels is uh, on regulation of uh, un 
hosted uh, wallets. And that was also uh, uh, said in the, in the previous panel that the EU um, uh, Commission, I think the Economy and Monetary Commission is discussing these rules, whether um, um, virtual asset service providers can interact with unhosted wallets. Uh, and basically, the, the, the decision was no, they can't, unless they get the identity of the unhosted uh, wallet owner. So um, Camila said earlier, if we start regulating uh, unhosted wallets, that's the, the, the death or the end of DeFi. Um, how do you see that as a regulator? I mean, is there a way around it, or would you would you also see? I'm the glad I'm not a regulator, <laughs> 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 but I, I need to apply regulations, uh, whether they are good or bad. Um, well, I, actually, in in, in you know the, this announcement with of this EU board subdivision of an AML group uh, has been just very recent, a couple of days ago, and I actually yesterday tried to dive into the jungle of EU legislation, and um, well. I figured, you know, so much to consumer pro protection and transparency, you simply don't really know where to find the real sources <laughs> because you find different things. But from what I understand, not being a EU lawyer, um, essentially, you know, the background is FATF. It has been mentioned before, uh, the DeFi guidelines, which now are about to be implemented, and the discussion is on how should the implementation take place in the details. And essentially, the rule that has been discussed is the same rule, more or less, which already applies as of today in Switzerland. So it's nothing extraordinary, at least from a Swiss perspective, and not that I necessarily share the result we have in Switzerland, but uh, uh, so it doesn't not per se kill DeFi as such. And the rule is also not, as far as I understand, to regulate all type of non-custodial wallet transaction. The concept, as I understand it, is transactions between a non-custodial wallet to a service provider. So uh, most likely it's financial intermediary. There the financial intermediary shall have the obligation. Whereas on a peer-to-peer -peer level, user-to-user -user level, the non-custodial wallet solution is not subject to any kind of regulatory uh, information obligations. That, that's my understanding as of today. And I sincerely hope that is the right understanding because anything else will be just outside kind of any privacy understanding I would have. No. Um, and, and interestingly enough, uh, if you look at those laws, then the key question is, well, who, who is a provider? Who mm. qualifies now in Switzerland terms of, as a financial intermediary? And, and the old understanding was, and that has been lasted for you know, decades, uh, I think it's the beginning of AML regulations being entered into force, that a financial intermediary is someone who actually has control over third party assets. You know, that's, you know, that's where the intermediary term comes from. And, and, and now in the, in the connection to DeFi, this understanding suddenly started to be shifted. And, and now, uh, at least in Switzerland, the understanding is it's already sufficient if you provide a certain level of infrastructure without having control over third-party assets. And that's a real danger to DeFi. And uh, it may well be that that's also a logic which then is going to, on the long run, apply within the EU, that you say, OK, it's, we, we, we look at you as a gateway provider. And um, you asked before, uh, will Web3 you know, be successful in staying on a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer level, or will we have centralized entities? And maybe it's not that black and white. Maybe uh, it, it is an intermediate path where we have gateways, which are subject to certain control, but we don't create the same dependency anymore from a user to a provider. So the provider doesn't hold my assets. He doesn't control the transactions. He can't cheat me the same way as in the old world uh, as someone could, but he still needs to provide a gateway. I can at any time switch to another gateway provider, so it's the same to the same smart contract setup. So I, I'm not dependent as much anymore, but it could well be that those gateways are going to be regulated. Mm -hmm. Let me see if we have uh, questions from the uh, audience. Don't 
doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> Everyone still listening. So I mean that uh, on the gateways, actually, you didn't, you, you hijacked the, the question, <laughs> but you never answered it. <laughs> yeah, but I have something to add to, uh, if, if there's not a, a question, then uh, about the Web3 yeah. part, because uh, one thing which uh, we are now discussing in uh, DeFi world or uh, Web3 world is uh, DAO frameworks, like decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, just to give you a background, like we have seen, like everybody would have read in the books, democracy is difficult. It's one of the most difficult concept to implement in the real life. That's why, like we are actually thinking about this from the framework of democracy, uh, decentralized autonomous organization, and that's what is going to be the driving force in the Web3. So it's going to be the small, large set of communities uh, who are going to bring, who are going to come and uh, play a role in this Web3 framework, who are going to enforce some decentralization rules. So it's going to be, so if, if, if one uh, system is not performing well, uh, then the communities or large communities can gather and vote them out, something like that. And we are, right now the system is not perfect. You've seen in the news the skewness, and there are various paper written by like the professors who are already there in the conference. Like there is a skewness in the voting pattern right now in DAO governance framework. Uh, like one or two people own like 50% of the voting power, uh, but that's going to change, and that's why I'm so bullish on the CBDC being into the retail world. More people will come in. Like it's like exactly like a democracy. You start giving adult franchise to everyone. It took world like. I don't know, 150 years to make up a mind that uh, the income and the voting power should be uncorrelated, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's difficult, but yeah, it's, it's doable as well. And uh, so, so could you see a decentralized autonomous national bank with governance tokens and <laughs> people voting on yeah, monetary yeah. policy with governance tokens? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you are amused with the idea as well. So <laughs> what? I, so we need, so monetary policy committee, four to five members, slow to react in this inflationary time. Uh, if you if you have like a dollar, if you have a SNF, like that's that's your vote. You. Probably central bank can start thinking about having a signal vote, not a vote. But probably people can vote and say, like, yeah, I signal, do something. <laughs> like, it would be faster. Morton, how comfortable would you be with a dumb bee? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think it's a long standing discussion in, in central banking, kind of like this rules versus discretion. And I think. Uh, I still think this thing that you cannot plan for all states of the world. And I, I think it's. It, I think. The DAOs will find out that central banking is actually part science and part art, okay? And so I, they, even though they might be, be slow to react and they might get it wrong, I don't think you can write rules for, for everything. And I think your experience, I was at the other side, I was working for the Fed during the Lehman crisis, and I, th you know, there was a lot of discretion there. And I think it was needed, and I, I think we saved the financial system, and that could not have done, been done with the rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the nice thing is that in the crypto world, you can do both. You can run these experiments, right? You can have something like liquidity being as rule-driven as possible, and then you can have DAOs that are completely fuzzy and full of people's discretion, and you can run these experiments over the same amount of time on the same population with limited impact. You know, it, and that's the, one of the most amazing things, I think, for this group to take away about the crypto economy is that, like, it's just applied macroeconomics. You can build these sort of toy environments and, and have answers really, really quickly. And the DeFi protocols that, that um, experiment with this stuff actually, you know, they learn and they iterate so, so fast because it's not just the simulations. It's not just Monte Carlo and every sort of edge case. It's they did it, they went through it, they changed it, they did it, they went through it, they changed it, and they went through it using risk capital. You know, and yeah, it sucks when things uh, are hacked and people lose money, but it's risk capital. It's, it, it's getting the sort of extraordinary return because it's there to take that risk. And so I think that's, that's one point I wanted to, to say. The other one, just to the, to the gateway point, um, I th and there was earlier in the day this comment that maybe you know, it's hard to get traditional assets into Maker, and then like Centrifuge isn't as big as you know, Olympus DAO and various other things that are, that are uh, 
more questionable than the good supply chain bonds uh, in centrifuge. You know, so um, I think to that point, my view is that DeFi and much of Web3 is dollar denominated. Uh, it should be seen as a national or supranational geopolitical strength, um, as, as kind of like a Western asset. It's already dollar denominated. Um, I think that there's huge demand for, um, for fiat onboarding in a smooth way. And I think that um, if there was a CBDC that was you know, congruent to the function of on-ramping, um, which lots of caveats, I think it would, it would be massively useful. You know, like if you look at the infrastructure of on-ramp today, it is a um, zombie clobbered together out of mm -hmm. sitting on, on a card network as a merchant, pretend, being a merchant of crypto assets in the same way that you would be a merchant of you know, sneakers or clothing and then you're connecting to some intermediate horizontal international brokerage layer, which is keeping weird omnibus accounts that you have to build systems in between as a merchant to the broker, and then the broker has strange custodian things all over the other place, you know, and, um, and it's just nonsense, honestly, um, and it's expensive because you're paying, you're paying the spread into the card networks, you're paying the spread into the brokerage, um, and it, it is also not native to um, crypto architecture. And so I think if there was a CBDC that took DeFi on its own terms and then built backwards as to how can, be the, how can we be the cash and equivalent in the system, I think that would just be fantastic. So from a central bank's point of view, we made some progress. We went from CBDC could be useful to could be massively useful if done the right way. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Let me see if there is now a question from the audience. Oh, there's actually a Question yeah. from the panel, to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hijacking Fantastic. your moderation role, <laughs> apologies. No, because just to pick on that, I was really wondering, now assuming uh, you would want to integrate uh, a private, non-public chain CBDC into a public chain environment, DeFi environment, how would that be done on a technical level, ideally? Oh. So uh, there are already some solutions which are being developed, and I think here me and Mike are having a full-day workshop around that, uh, half-day workshop. And there are some solutions which are uh, kind of a bridge. Okay. Uh, bridge are now not in a good news right now because two of them got <laughs> hacked, $600 million and same. But, uh, but the technology is developing. So what you can actually have a bridge CBDC own blockchain and uh, the various other blockchain, let's say, ETH scalable solution, and there's going to be a secure bridge. Like and a bridge can, between different blockchains, like we have EOS, whatever. Yes, and, and the nature Not of a that. blockchain, though. Yeah. EOS. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> again. But, then, <laughs> but the main, main part is that, okay, the technology exists. People are willing to invest on that. The framework of that bridge, like how much regulation you want to do on the bridge and certain things, that's, that's debatable. Like, you know, you can have the collaborative bridge or... Um, that specification can be decided. And the bridge will be operated by the national bank or would it be a private bridge? That's what I'm saying, like it is, <laughs> it has to be decided. Um, but the main, the main part is like, as I begin, uh, like uh, we don't see uh, this as like a David Goliath kind of a story, right? We see as a collaborative and learning framework because we understand the value of a, uh, institution, the independent institution, like, you know, it's supposedly independent. <laughs> uh, um, and the people are willing to work uh, uh, around the regulation. So we have, so because uh, we have been working closely with the large institutions, and of course, they have this historical thing of working closely with the regulators and all, but they also, they are willing to give away small efficiency gain with gaining the acceptance in the regulatory world. Mm -hmm. But it has to come with some cost. The, as, as I said, like the cost cannot be infinite. You wanna, you're not gonna say to other person, shut down the shop and be regulated. Like that's like that's something not bizarre. Like you know, it's not gonna work. Yeah. More? No, just uh, before we close the session, I, I just wanted to give. Uh, there's also a question back there, but but just before we end, like before I, I just want to get a shout out to the organizing committee. So uh, just want to thank uh, Mike Alonso, Henry Holden 
Oliver Sequest, Richard Gell, and Natalia Lutzen for really organizing this conference. And I think they've done a, an amazing job. So if we could just give them a quick round of applause. <laughs> No, absolutely, but we are not quite there yet. <laughs> so we, we have a question from the audience, I understand. Yeah, I oh, this one at the last minute. I, I, I guess it's directed at Lex, but any, anyone on the panel can pick it up. I was a bit scandalized by what Lex said at the end, uh, embracing uh, CBDCs on, uh, on, on blockchain. Um, and uh, um, which seemed to be a change in your position since the beginning. <laughs> um, um, here's my question. You know, in with public chains, uh, if there is, you know, if there's a contentious fork, like there was with Ethereum, uh, which created Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, the the native coins on the uh, on on those chains uh, split as well. So you have, you know, Ether and you know Ethereum Classic. With with centralized stable coins or CBDCs, you obviously can't have that. Like the the issuer of that token onto the blockchain uh, is going to choose which of the two versions of the protocol it sees itself being on. And that obviously, if there is a stable coin, or particularly if there's a CBDC uh, that is uh, um, that lives on a public chain and it's very popular and and widely used gives the issuer of that token an enormous amount of influence over the governance of the layer one protocol. So the question is, if there was a CBDC that, like Lex said, was sort of built back from you know, the first principles of DeFi, would, and it was popular and widely used you know, throughout the, the chain's ecosystem, would that not effectively make the protocol, the layer one protocol, regulated by um, uh, by the issuer of that uh, that digital currency that's a that's a really interesting question um, and I'd love to hear what others think as well um, I'm just going to answer on intuition uh, it's it's mere opinion I think just to reconcile the the earlier bit I think th the distinction I would make is that um, sort of f forcing uh, orthodox architecture or forcing a CBDC architecture into the crypto world or forcing a, um, you know, like a traditional payments architecture into the crypto world is not going to work. Like that, that world should be able to grow on its own. However, building a way for fiat value to onboard into that world and then exist in it, I think is a, is a highly fruitful thing. So hopefully that, that clears the distinction a little bit. Um, but as I understand your question, you're saying that let's say there's a CBDC that's plugged into a chain and it becomes so systemically important to that chain that you know, the chain can't really fork because the, the fork chain won't have a real version of, of that currency anymore because it's maybe not redeemable on the other side of the bridge or, or something of that nature. I think it's a really interesting question. I, I don't know off the top of my head of examples that, that have run into something like that. I mean, I would guess, I would say that in all forks, there are really powerful players as it relates to those chains, right? So the, the, the miners and the developers are large political groups that um, heavily influence the direction of which chain will be successful, right? So if Curve went with E3 and didn't go to ETH2, uh, or w whatever chain, maybe e e EOS, uh, then essentially the presence of that protocol would still king make the, or queen make that, that fork chain. So I think because the ecosystem is much bigger and it's much healthier, we do have to think about these issues that it's not just the miners and the core developers that matter now. It is the, the DeFi protocols that decide to build their business there. It's the NFT platforms that are driving Web3 commerce. It's the you know, if you connect traditional finance into it, then it's the traditional finance providers that, that are part of it. So I do think um, you, you will have politics around these forks no matter what. Um, but yeah, that's it. I, would, I would love to have that problem uh, and solve it if, if it does happen. Great question. We will put it on the to-do list of the Swiss Center. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we have to stop here because we still have the concluding uh, remarks by Andrea Mechler. But let me thank the panelists for, for this discussion. Thank you so much.
Good job.